All right, everyone. I would like to welcome virtually to the Summit for Space Sustainability, Director of NOAA's Office of Space Commerce. Again, I think many of you are familiar with Rich, who has had an illustrious career in our community, ranging from the Clinton White House to Virgin Galactic and a number of other businesses. I am deeply pleased and honored to have this be one of his first public addresses in his new role. We also will be taking questions at the end of his session. So Rich is going to give us a keynote, and then he has uh, graciously agreed to have a few audience questions. We will still be using the Whova app, so please make sure you navigate over to this keynote if you'd like to be in the list for questions. Can we go ahead and bring Rich up? All right, Rich, stage is yours. Good afternoon, all. I hope you are well and having a great conference. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. I Actually, this is a great time for um, an international gathering. The ideas, the challenges that we face, the ideas that I'm sure are circulating uh, there at the conference are ones that I would very much like to hear. Um, first of all, my thanks to the UK Space Agency for their support of this conference. Uh, my thanks, my special thanks to Secure World Foundation. You know, um, Secure World has been doing this for a long time. I mean, their commitment to space sustainability, to uh, the issues that we're addressing today, it started over 15 years ago. And I think at the time, um, everyone kind of said, what's this small organization from Colorado talking about space for? And what is space sustainability? And now um, they have done, uh, they have an incredible body of work over the years and uh, kudos to Cindo Ar Cinda Arsenault, who's the founder of Secure World and, and the great team there who have uh, been maintaining uh, a focus on this issue for years. Uh, one of the reasons I'm sorry to miss um, this conference in London is that in many ways, my own journey started in London um, at, a, at a conference. It was called Improving Our Vision in 2006. And I remember, like all good stories, this one started in a bar uh, in, in, in London. And we were sitting around after the conference and uh, the operators, the large geo operators were complaining about how hard it was to communicate to each other about their maneuvers, about their planned maneuvers. And at the time they literally were calling each other on the telephone to talk about planned maneuvers. And, uh, I think it was Teresa Hitchens, who was then an analyst at the Center for Defense Information said, you just need to invent a babble fish. And the, of course that was a reference to the Douglas Adams book, Hitchhiker's Guide, but a uh, universal translator. And I remember Joe Chan, who was the flight director of Intelsat said, well, yeah, we could do that. And from that conversation began a dialogue which led to the creation of the Space Data Association, which was an industry formed attempt to start to come to grips with some of the issues that we're still dealing with today. How do you, how do you communicate? How do you communicate what you are doing specifically? How do operators communicate a maneuver? Or how do they talk to each other about potential problems? And also how do they engage with governments? And I think, uh, honestly, um, that experiment was not fully successful because I think the government wasn't ready. Uh, the governments weren't ready at that time to acknowledge the uh, private sector as a full partner in this enterprise. And I think one of the wonderful things that's happened over the intervening 15 years is that there has been a significant change and, an, and a desire to embrace um, the creativity and the dynamism of the private sector in helping to solve critical problems. And I'll get more into that uh, a little bit uh, as we get into the remarks. But a little bit about my office. I think um, some of you may know the Office of Space Commerce in the Department of Commerce. Um, it, 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 it aspires like the Secure World Foundation to, to uh, a, a small office that aspires to have a large impact. We do have a new role um, from uh, the Space Policy Directive 3 from the last administration um, directed that the Commerce Department take, take over the current responsibilities uh, being done by the Space Force. And those are um, uh, the agreements to share information, uh, create a catalog, warn of potential uh, conjunctions, 
uh, and to work closely with the private sector and our international partners. <clears throat> so that's a big job. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But in addition to those things, uh, we also have a regulatory role. Initially, our regulatory um, portfolio is limited to earth imaging. Um, we are in discussion with the White House and will eventually be in discussion with the Congress about perhaps expanding that role to uh, what they refer to as Article 6 authorities under the Outer Space Treaty, which means things not, uh, the governments have a responsibility to, to do uh, continuing oversight and supervision of the activities of their nationals under the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and of course we have the FAA, which handles launch and recovery. We have the FCC, which, which uh, is worried about spectrum and orbital position. And, but there are a lot of new activities coming along um, Low Earth Orbit Commerce, um, CIS lunar activities, eventually rovers on the moon, and a bunch of future things that we need, which today seem far, uh, far away, but which will be upon us soon enough. So uh, that's a dialogue we'll have in the future, uh, but those things are uh, potential. So in terms of uh, the our office taking over the responsibilities of the uh, uh, currently handled by the Space Force. The question is, well, what is it exactly that we're going to do? And so what the policy directive said is that you'll continue to provide the basic services supplied today. And I've been on kind of a listening tour to satellite operators uh, asking them, well, what do you think the basic services are? And their first reaction is usually kind of glib. They go, well, it's you know what I'm getting today. And I say, are you happy with what you're getting today? And they say, oh, no, no, I'm, there are many things we're not happy about. And I said, well, then I'm sure you don't want me to do exactly what's happening today. So why don't we have a dialogue about what are the things that you're looking for? And once you prompt, uh, I think the people who actually fly satellites for a living and who live this every day have a really, uh, they're really, e it's easy to get a list out of them. And some of the things um, they are looking for are very practical things like more rapid cataloging of objects after launch. That, that, is, that has been and continues to be an issue. Um, and the rate and latency of screening uh, is, is currently probably too slow for, for commercial operators. Um, so they'd like to see collision avoidance screening um, multiple times a day with very low latency. Um, and uh, one of the complaints that has been uh, a long time complaint of operators is operators say, I'm willing to share my um, location information with you, my ephemeris. I'm willing to share my location and my maneuver data if you'll only ingest it into your system. And uh, unfortunately, the um, the current systems are not agile enough to do that on a routine basis for all commercial operators. So the <clears throat> so a lot of the value of that sharing of information is, is lost. And then of course, operators would like special screening for maneuvers and the simplest of all acts, they would like uh, a web API for the exchange of information. Coming full circle back to our discussion in the pub in 2006, which is we still really haven't solved the, the basic fundamental issue of how do we effortlessly talk to uh, each other? So this dialogue started with well-established, well-funded geostationary orbit operators. And they all had sophisticated flight dynamics teams. And, and But now we're in a totally different world. Operating in geo, is like, I always say operating in geo is like living in the suburbs. You got lots of room, it's a nice environment, your neighbors are, are far far enough away to be friendly. Um, and you come down to Leo and it's inner city living down there. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's a lot more dynamic environment. And so we need to have systems which are keeping pace with what is actually going on um, in the dynamic environment in low Earth orbit, the mega constellations, the tremendous uh, creativity and low Earth orbit services, 
Eventually, as I said, low Earth orbit, perhaps manufacturing, commerce, and things like that. So we have to have systems that are capable of doing that. So we need to we need to go to the next level. So I have been uh, talking to not only the operators about what they need, but I have been on a listening tour with all the SSA providers, all the, um, the folks who've got cre incredibly creative ideas uh, for helping to manage this process. So what we'll be doing this uh, summer and fall, um, uh, assuming our partners in the United States Congress continue to uh, give us the funding that we need, um, we will be um, uh, doing some data buying. We're going to be doing some contracting for essential commercial services. Uh, and we'll be doing, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, be have some systems up and running very soon uh, and comparing data quality. And again, all of this is targeted to, to an, uh, an IOC initial operational capability in, in 2004. So we have a lot of work this year to do. We're also um, uh, staffing up the, the office. You know, everyone always wants to talk about the, um, the actual tools and technologies for uh, SSA. And I always say, you know, that's like talking about the airplane and that's important. I do need an airplane, but I'm really, what I need to be talking about is the, is the global air aircraft, the, the global air transportation system. So when it's great that there are all these great technologies, but they have to be in an international environment where we all agree on what's going on. So at the front end, back to the babblefish issue, we need standards, clarity on how we ingest data, what kinds of data we ingest, the quality of data, how we validate data. So we need agreements. There, are, There's some great work going on in the CCSDS, the, the standards group that's doing this tremendous uh, work there and want to encourage that going forward. Um, we need, on the other side, we need rules of the road uh, where there are developed generally understood principles by all space operators for how one handles various evolving situations in space. And then um, we probably need to have a pretty uh, frank discussion about operation, operator responsibilities. Um, there are a lot of things that operators are willing to do today, like for example, share their ephemeris and their maneuver information. And the question is, should there be things that operators are, are um, required to do? Um, and the FCC, give credit where credit is due here, uh, put out a very, I think, bold and challenging uh, document a couple of years ago uh, on, uh, they did a report and order on space debris and, and mitigation. And it raised a bunch of issues, a bunch of really complicated issue about operator responsibility um, and, and about how we intended to manage um, this new environment. And I look forward to engaging with my colleagues uh, at the FCC on those on those, but it, but if you haven't seen that document, it, it it's a bit long. It's not exactly a page turner, but I, I do highly recommend it if you're interested in this field. Uh, it does it does seek to raise some really important issues. Um, so in terms of my priorities, um, we our biggest challenge uh, is to get the tools in place. To, to do the transition that we've been instructed to do for the responsibilities that are currently held uh, by the Space Force. Um, the first step in that journey um, is a, a memorandum of agreement between the Commerce Department and the Defense Department, and we're well underway on that, and I hope to have that wrapped up this summer. Um, and then we need to engage with you all for your creativity and your ideas. And again, I'm sorry, I can't be there today to actually talk to you in the context of this important conference. But we need, we do need your ideas because um, this is, as I said before, this is a much, much bigger picture than just, uh, we're gonna have a, a really sophisticated 
uh, fusion engine that's going to be able to do orbital determination and conjunction assessment. It, it's well beyond that. Uh, we need this in a global context. We need to have our international partners working with us on this. We need to understand how to exchange information uh, and validate that information in a way that is safe, secure, and, and, uh, and accurate. So we have a bunch of big technical challenges. We also have some policy challenges ahead of us, how we redefine our relationships. What are the responsibilities of, of the new generation of operators in space? And what things should we be doing and shouldn't be doing as we go forward? So it's a big, it's a big bunch uh, of tasks. And um, I'm only heartened by the fact that I know in my dialogue with you all, that you have incredible ideas. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing those and, and getting together on a routine and regular basis uh, to discuss those ideas. Um, I promised that I would leave a few minutes for, for questions. And so uh, why don't I wrap up there and see if there are any questions in the audience. But I warn you in advance that I've only been in the position a handful of weeks. So the answer to some of your questions may be, I don't know, I will check. So with that, um, if anyone has a question, I would very much uh, be happy to answer it. Excellent, and absolutely, Rich. I will keep that in mind as I select the questions. We do have lots rolling in. I'm gonna start with, I don't know, either the hardest or the easiest one. Um, this question came in early, and it, it's, it's about your vision for the future of your particular office. You know, how does the office of space commerce fit into the broader ecosystem, you know, with the Space Council and NASA and the Space Force. You've mentioned some of it during your speech, but, you know, can you share with us, you know, how you see your office moving forward? Well, again, I think that um, I, I see the office, and everything, of course, has to be cautioned by, um, it depends, we are guided by the principles articulated by the administration in conjunction with our colleagues in the United States Congress who fund and provide the authorities we need to do specific tasks, particularly regulatory tasks. But what my vision is, um, and is that this is an office, well, first and foremost, that we will execute on the, on the, um, uh, on the task of implementing an open architecture data repository that, uh, that provides basic services to commercial and civil international entities for free. That's sort of our baseline. Um, we also want to be advocates broadly for industry, but specifically also advocates for the SSA industry, such there is a robust there is robust advanced services industry such that one of the things, and again, one of the issues that we need to discuss about operator responsibility is should operators have a, be required to have some sort of certified safety service uh, to, when they operate their fleets? And that probably could be, it could be handled externally um, or it could be handled with a, with a sophisticated internal flight dynamics team. So, but those are all dialogues that we need to have uh, going forward. So an advocacy role that is both on SSA, but, but beyond it, encouraging um, and trying to be a troubleshooter for, for companies who are, who, are, who are struggling either with licensing or regulation or with some challenge, export control or some challenge um, uh, with the government. And then finally, regulatory. We are today the regulator for earth imaging. Um, that is a, a tiny subcategory of the activities that will be going on in the future. And I think we are in open dialogue with the administration and with, with the Hill about whether we should fill that gap. What's the most appropriate way to fill the gap that we all see in the authorities of the US? So I see us playing a, a larger uh, role in that in that space. Absolutely, well thank you. Um, I think you're aware that the panel uh, just preceding lunch, so right before you was led by Brian Whedon, and we were having a conversation about transatlantic space traffic management in air quotes. Uh, so we have a question from the audience here saying, how will your office work with the EU on matters related to STM practices and norms? Well, that's a very timely question. I believe <laughs> next week we have uh, a, a couple days in DC of where, where we're having an ESEU dialogue. And there is a, a large portion of the agenda focused on this issue. So I look, I look forward to engaging with, 
my colleagues in the EU on these topics and uh, I look forward to those sessions next week. But I think it all starts with the willingness to, to talk to each other and to identify issues that we are struggling with. And I'm sure that there's a lot of interesting concern about whether the services, how the services currently provided uh, by the Space Force will be will continue to be provided by my office. And I look forward to, uh, to addressing those uh, anxieties and, and hopefully beginning of, of an important multi-year dialogue. As I said previously, I mean, this is not something that the US can just do. It's not something that if we're super clever, we can solve the problem. This is something that requires the engagement of all nations. And again, without touching the third rail of politics these days, I mean, there we have some, so we have some international, it is an internationally complex environment. Um, and, and right now we think we need a full dialogue with all space faring nations. Um, and, and we can't have any major nation who's not participating in this dialogue. Um, if we're going to be operating thousands of satellites in the same place, we have to have means of rapid, accurate communication. And so that's another level of the challenges that we'll be facing. Well, you know that Secure World absolutely agrees with you when it comes to the need to have all countries and all actors uh, who are affected uh, at the table. So thank you for that. I want to turn to a question about industry. You mentioned that you've sort of been doing a listening tour. And so one of our audience's questions is delving a little deeper into that. So they said, what are the key barriers to industry and government working together to ensure space sustainability? And how can we overcome some of those challenges? You know, what are you encountering in your new role in that area? Um, I think that if I can start out and without criticism, I think that the, you know, the Space Force has done a, a, a very good job given that, you know, 15 years ago, when we started this dialogue, the, uh, I think the reaction of a lot of folks in the then Air Force, uh, uh, the, the basic reaction we got was, well, it, this isn't my job. It's not my job to help you all in, in industry. I mean, I have other things I need to worry about. So, so we went from that initial reaction. And that was the initial reaction, quite frankly, that the Space Data Association got, um, was we don't have time, we, we neither have time nor inclination to worry about your problems, commercial industry. And I think we've, we've of course, had a tremendous sea change there. And, and I hope with the transition to our office that, that there is a level of service provided um, uh, th that is um, that is more timely and, and allows for the rapid increase. Um, and, and also, I think that just from a, as we've seen the, the space become more and more complicated, I do think we'll see this differentiation between the military will have a more military focus and we will have, um, we will hopefully be able to uh, meet the needs of the civil and uh, commercial entities. Excellent, thank you. Um, and obviously you have a lot of insight into that from your previous role before this one. Um, I have two more questions if that's all right for you, I think. Um, one is kind of taking a, a slightly different turn. Um, how will human space safe, sorry, space flight safety protections figure into the DOC? I mean, that's obviously something that's also been shared among uh, several agencies. I think that is the, as they say, that is the deep end of the pool. Right, so we have been a regulator for imaging of the Earth, um, and uh, not that that's unimportant or 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 simple, um, but it 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 does not involve the complex layers of worrying about human safety. So, if we were going to take over the so-called Article Six authorities, the 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 responsibility for activities not associated with launch or or recovery. Mm -hmm. um, we would eventually encounter the responsibility to start worrying about human safety and reliability of systems. Um, that's not something that is on our agenda today or quite frankly, even next year, but um, it could eventually be. And the good news is that uh, just like our colleagues at the FAA, 
Well, first of all, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge uh, amongst our colleagues at the FAA who've been dealing with this for years. And of course, we have uh, NASA and the other space agencies who've been uh, important partners in the development of the current rules that exist for launch and recovery. So I would see it as a, as a complex partnership where if, if we are tasked with that authority and we have not been today, um, if we were tasked with that authority, I think we would have a lot of uh, support and assistance in the interagency community. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to talk about one uh, question here this after near and dear to my heart since my day job is focusing on uh, earth application policy. And as you said, that's one of the core duties that your office has always had. Um, so our question is, can you speak to any coming changes to non-earth imaging policy and how they may impact opportunities for on-orbit sensors for ATM? And I, I would treat this as an opportunity to just really share where you see the, the new policies going. I think that, I mean, just to observe a curious thing about our authorities. Our authorities aren't for all imaging systems, like for example, electronic uh, gathering systems, various systems for detecting radio frequency interference and other things, but don't fall under our purview. So there are some, there are some curious gaps um, in even um, the, the, the remote sensing uh, regulations that exist today that I think we would need to relook at um, where are we going as there is this multiplicity of new new systems being developed. I know that um, uh, we have recently revamped the remote sensing guideline, uh, the rules, uh, the regulations for remote sensing, and so I think the team. Um, uh, is reasonably happy with where they are right now. Uh, we are also staffing up that group um, uh, and hopefully that if we were to get new authorities, that would be the place that we would put additional energy. But on the specifics of, of the actual remote sensing regulation and what things specifically we need right now, I'm, I'm just going to have to plead mm -hmm. the new guy defense and, and say, I look forward to learning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last question, I promise. I want to sneak one more in. Since we are in an international conference, and I, and I really appreciate your willingness to do this, I know how hard it is to be a speaker to an audience you can't see, but I can assure you, you have a room full of almost 300 people uh, rapidly listening to everything you're saying, and I want to end on one that kind of acknowledges the global nature of this question of your work, of the work of the UKSA as our co-host. And so the question is, how can regulators work more closely together across international borders to drive consensus around global standards, rules, processes, and systems? This one specifically says for space traffic management, but I'm going to open it up broadly. Like, how do you see the international order working? You commented on this a little, but let, let's end on that note. Well, I think there's, there's such a broad spectrum uh, of the things you just uh, asked about. I mean, at one level, uh, very practically, um, we have the standards process, which is slow, it's time consuming, it's, it's technically, you know, it, it requires detailed focus and, and it's, but it's essential, right? But it's essential. And, and I think that there has been an effort uh, by groups such as the CCSDS um, to engage globally initially. And so I think governments su supplying their support for these standards processes um, is, is key. Um, and, and then at the other end of the spectrum, uh, th there, there, are, there is an important role for open forum, like the UN's Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Space, for the broad discussion uh, of, of these ideas, for the, for, for the sort of unrestricted dialogue about where the world is and wants to go. But I also believe that with the example, recent example of the Artemis Accords, um, there is an ex there, there's an important role for like-minded nations to take immediate action together. So I think we need all the tools. We need the hard, the, the hard and painful work of standards processes that allow us to communicate better and allow our machines to communicate better. 
We need the broad dialogue of the international community, the involvement of the policy people and the space lawyers and, and the whole discussion. But then in the middle, we need an ability in the, in the shorter term to take action when like-minded action makes sense. And so I think we need to keep all those tools at the ready. <clears throat> and I look, like I said, I look forward to our dialogue next uh, week with uh, EU <clears throat> on some of these really important topics. And uh, I look forward to working my, with my colleagues uh, internationally uh, on this and related space commercial topics. Well, thank you, Rich. That couldn't have ended that on a better note. We need all the tools. And I, I think we see that in our other panels. And I couldn't agree with you more. So again, I want to thank you as the conference chair for the Summit for Space Sustainability. We've been delighted to have you. We will be sure to report back everything else we discussed since you couldn't make it here in person. And uh, again, thank you for your time today. But all the magic happens in the pub after the meeting. That's, that's oh, what I Oh, no, no, don't worry. We have a reception uh, tomorrow night in the Exploring Space Hall. So we, we've got it covered. All righty. Have a great conference, everyone.